we've been away for a couple of weeks, had some appointments, had to uh, take care of, and also we, last week we had the Holy Week observances, uh, so we had not been together for a couple of weeks, but we're back, we're back, we're back, my brother Dennis here in the beautiful sanctuary at the First Baptist Church of Cherry Hill. We are so glad that you took the time to tune in uh, to this Bible study. We're grateful to God that we're able to have Bible study. Uh, we're looking for that time when we will have the Bible study in person like we do our Sunday school on Sunday morning. So we're grateful uh, for you to uh, be with us on this, uh, for this lesson. Thank you, Lord, for this day, the mercies of this day. We ask in the name of Jesus that you continually uh, show your shower and blessings upon us. And Lord, we ask that you would bless this, uh, this teaching uh, that has been done uh, in your sight, God, and be well done in your sight. We thank you, God, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, we want to continue in our study of the book of Hebrews uh, just to, just to uh, call to your remembrance that the book of Hebrews, or the letter of Hebrews, uh, was written to a group of professing Hebrew Christians who were seriously considering uh, leaving the Christian faith uh, and going back into Judaism uh, because of the persecution that they, they faced. Uh, they began to rationalize, if you will, uh, their faith and compromise the truth. Uh, they were asking, uh, why can't we believe in Christ in the Old Testament sense? Uh, for that was good enough to save Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all other Jews up to the death of Christ. So the author of Hebrews, what he wants to do, he counters all the arguments of the professing Hebrew Christians by showing uh, these things that we looked at. Remember, he's countering their arguments uh, or their desire to go back to Judaism, uh, that Jesus Christ is God's last spokesman to humanity, Jesus is superior to angels, Jesus is superior to Moses, and Jesus is superior to the Levitical priesthood. And so that's where we have been. We have been proving, uh, the writer has been proving uh, to those Christians the superiority of Jesus. Uh, and prior to the 10th chapter of Hebrews, uh, which we will look at tonight, the, the writer emphasized that Jesus' priesthood belongs to a better order and functions on the basis of a better covenant. But all of these depend on what is now, what we're going to address now in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to be talking about the Jesus' superior sacrifice. Jesus' superior sacrifice. Uh, the Hebrew writer addresses this important topic by describing why Jesus' sacrifice under the New Testament is superior to the sacrifices offered under the Old Covenant or if you will, the Law of Moses. The Hebrew writer wants to show these professing Hebrew Christians that Christ's sacrifice for sin is the supreme sacrifice and that one sacrifice is the fulfillment and the end of all Old Testament prophecies. The author's ultimate point is this, that there is no salvation apart from the death of Jesus Christ for sins and sin, for sin and sin. So we're going to be looking at uh, breaking down Hebrews chapter 10. The first uh, sub-point, if you will, important point is the need for a better sacrifice. The need for a better sacrifice. Verses 1 through 4 in chapter 10. Let's look at verse 1. Saints, that in verse 1, you see the clearest statement in the whole Bible that the Mosaic Law was designed by God to be a type or picture or, if you will, a shadow that pointed toward Christ, who was to come. Saints, the Old Testament dealt with shadows, but the New Testament deals with the actual substance of Jesus Christ. The sacrificial system, and those of you who studied with me before we studied the sacrificial system, the sacrificial system of the law was a type or a picture of the sacrifice that Jesus would make. It was, as the writer said, it was a shadow of it. It wasn't a real thing. It pointed to something that was coming. 
This meant that the Old Testament system or covenant was temporary. It could accomplish nothing permanent. Look at verse uh, 1 again. The, and, and, that, and that Old Testament, Old Testament system in itself could not save a person. Because only the death of Christ has been the basis of salvation for all believers of all time. The Old Testament sacrifices in themselves could not make a person perfect because before God because they were only shadows and not the actual substance. Uh, for people to be saved, my brothers and sisters, they must be perfect. For only perfect people can have a perfect fellowship with God. Now, we understand that nobody's perfect. There's only one who's been perfect, Christ Jesus. So, so when I talk about perfect, I'm talking about position with God. Those who receive Christ by faith have the death of Christ applied to them, and they become, have, they receive, I should say, a perfect standing or position before God. We call that, uh, in theology terms, we call that justification. That because of Jesus' sacrifice, God accepted his sacrifice, and those who accept Jesus, they are made perfect. They receive the righteousness of Christ. So, so it was a great exchange at the cross. Our sins were transmuted to Christ. His righteousness is transferred to all those who believe in him. And when we believe in him, we have a perfect standing before God because God does not see the sin. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ or the righteousness of Christ. He who became, who, he who knew no sin became sin for us. Every Christian in his experience, we still sin. <laughs> we will sin until we die. But his position in Christ is perfect. So we, we have that. So verse 2, in verse 2, chapter 10 of Hebrews. You see that? Old Testament saints made repeated animal sacrifices for their sins. And each year, the high priest in Israel made a sacrifice on what we call the Day of Atonement, where he atoned for the sins of the whole nation, that they of atonement. Saints, this process was a repeated process, but it could never cleanse the conscience of sin. It could never do away with sin. Only the death of Christ can actually cleanse one's conscience. Hebrews 9.14. Hebrews 9.14. Old Testament animal sacrifices merely covered sin until Christ would come to die for sin. Each year, the death, the death of sin for every true believer in Israel was covered, but it was never taken away. It was temporary. This debt continued to pile up against the Old Testament believer, and his debt was not paid until Christ die for sins. Uh, we sing that song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Look at verse 3 and 4. Let's look at verses 3 and 4, chapter 10 of Hebrews. For, you ready? But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came to the world, stop right there. Look at that verse 3 and 4 again. See, each time an Old Testament believer offered an animal sacrifice, he was reminded of his sin and had to make that offering as he made the offering over and over again. Animal sacrifices could never completely deal with human guilt or human sin. God promised forgiveness to believing worshipers. We can see that in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20, verse 26, verse 31, and verse 35 in the fourth chapter of Leviticus. But this was just a judicial covering of sin, and it was not the removal of guilt from people's heart. It was not a complete cleansing that God. So the annual day of atonement 
did not accomplish, watch this, the annual day of atonement did not accomplish uh, the remission of sin, but only the reminder of sin. So every time they did those sacrifices, they were reminded of their sin. So saints, the annual repetition of the ceremony was evidence that the previous year's sacrifices had not done the job. You see, if the previous year's sacrifices had done the job, then you wouldn't have to have another sacrifice the next year. Because again, you can see it was just a temporary covering. The nation of Israel's sins were covered, but they were not removed. There was a desperate need for a better or supreme sacrifice because the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. The blood of bulls and goats could cover sin and postpone judgment, but could never affect a once and for all redemption. See, bulls and goats could not redeem us. A better or supreme sacrifice was needed. Only the better, only the supreme sacrifice of the Son of God could remove sin. Here's an important point number two. The provision of a better sacrifice. The provision of a better sacrifice. Versus uh, uh, looking at uh, Hebrews 10 verses 5 and 6. The author of Hebrews in verses 5 and 6 he now quotes from Psalm 40, verse 6 and 8, uh, through 8. You have to understand, my brothers and sisters, that the book of Hebrews, among the other books of the New Testament, borrowed heavily from the Old Testament, because the Old Testament was a shadow of things to come. So this is a direct reference to King David, but is also applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. God's real desire was not the death of sacrificed animals, but the death of Jesus Christ. But that was going to accomplish, that was going to satisfy him or appease his wrath. God was not really pleased, although he instituted the Old Testament sacrificial system, because it could not forgive sin, but it only covered them. God was, now, now watch, now, now understand. God was well pleased uh, when the Old Testament saints offered sacrifices because this was a demonstration of their faith and the promise of the Messiah to come. You know, God instituted, they were supposed to obey that, but it was still only a temporary cover. It was only, it was pointing to something else. It was a shadow of something to come. Um, however, God only delighted in animal sacrifices as they, as I said, pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lamb who takes away the sin of all the world, of all those who lay hold of Him by faith. He takes away your sin, my sin, our sin, if we take a hold of Him in faith. Uh, uh, there was an instance where uh, John the Baptist was, uh, was, was doing something and Jesus was passing by, and John just, he just yelled out, Behold, the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. John understood that Jesus was that Lamb. All those lambs for thousands of years that they had sacrificed was not going to be the one ultimately to take away uh, the sin, the sin of man's sin. Jesus was the big L, the big Lamb that was ordained before the foundation of the world to die. Uh, saints, uh, the animal sacrifices, again, pointed to Christ's body which was prepared by God. Uh, understand, uh, long before God spoke, uh, He, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed in before eternity. In all eternity, they've always been. And they had an eternal, eternal counsel in the heavens. And they agreed that Jesus was going to be the one to lead heaven's glory. Take upon Himself a sinless human nature and die on the cross for God's people. Saints, you got to say, you see, Christ was the lamb that was slain according to the eternal 
plan of God before the earth existed, before the universe came into being, it was already planned that Christ would be that sacrificial lamb to die for men's sin. Uh, let, let's look at something. I want you to look at something real quick. I want you to look at First Peter. All the way back, First Peter, First Peter, chapter one. First Peter, chapter one. Verse 18 and 20. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 20. Remember, I told you uh, Christ was the Lamb uh, that was ordained to come before the world existed in the eternal plan of God. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers, talking about the sin that you received from Adam. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he had no sin. He was chosen before the creation of the world. See that? He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these times for your sake. Okay? Another, another verse I want you to look at is Revelation 13, 8. Revelation 13, 8. Revelation 13, verse 8. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. It was always part of God's eternal plan for Jesus to die for man's sin. Saints, in the eternal counsel of God, it was written that Christ would do the Father's will. We all know from the gospel that Christ always did the will of his father. But the primary place that Christ was obedient or did the father's will was at the cross. That demonstrated his ultimate obedience. At the cross, Jesus solved the sin problem for all time. Saints, Calvary was the ultimate performance of the father's will being done by his son. Saints, the death of Jesus Christ was no afterthought in God's mind. The death of Jesus was no accident. It was a part of God's eternal plan. God sent his son and Christ voluntarily submitted himself to the Father's will and redeemed God's people forever. He voluntarily, voluntarily came down and took it. This body. Count it not robbery, as Paul writes in Philippians. The very source of Christ's sacrifice, because when he wanted to accomplish the sovereign will of his Father. Important point number three. The character of Christ's sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8 through 9. Look at verse 8. See that? The whole animal sacrificial system was based on the Mosaic law. But neither the law nor animal sacrifices could save people. Most Jews perverted the intentions of the law in the first place and felt that they could only be saved if they kept the words of the law. That's why the Jewish leader had a problem, had so much problems with Jesus because they thought Jesus had come to overturn the law. Jesus said, no, I, I, I have not come to, 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 to destroy the law but to keep fulfilled the law. And he did. So he was just trying to tell them, all this stuff y'all been studying, all this stuff y'all been reading is pointing to me. Uh, verse 9. Look at verse 9. Saints, Christ's sacrifices were based on his own character. The, again, he voluntarily gave himself up in obedience that he might redeem the true people of God. Look at, uh, I want you to get a chance to read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, and John 10, verse 11. Saints, the death, now get this, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross brought to an end the Mosaic or the Old Covenant and established the New Covenant. The death of Jesus was not only the beginning of something new, but 
it was also the final and complete termination of the old. The old covenant now was no longer needed because Christ had replaced the old covenant. And when he was at the, when he was at the, uh, we do it every communion. When he was at the table with his disciples in the upper room, when he told them this, when he told them to drink, this is my blood of the new covenant which was shed for you. Everything now will be based on my blood. I'm the sacrifice that now that you don't have to worry about uh, sacrifice on these bulls and goats uh, anymore. I am the sacrifice. And point, point number four. The purpose of Christ's sacrifice, the purpose of Christ's sacrifice. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10, Hebrews chapter 10. Again, animal sacrifices could not save rational human beings. But in Christ, there is real salvation. Um, you said we're sanctified, I think in King James sanctified. Uh, sanctification in this context, those who study with me understand that sanctification means to be set apart. And it, it's a part of salvation. Once you and I accept Christ as our Savior, we're justified. That means now we have a right position with God. God won't destroy us now. We belong to Him. But there's a process called sanctification where all that old stuff that we have, this our sin nature, He begins to work on us so we can become more like Christ. That's kind of the, that's what we call sanctification. So that means a Christian, a Christian is positionally set apart for God. So at the moment of salvation, you and I begin the sanctification process and one day, uh, after we die we see Jesus, we be glorified. That means no more, the body won't be carried anymore, no more sin. Uh, when Paul talks about this, uh, again, uh, Paul talks about what the Hebrew writer is talking about in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, again, when he talks about justification uh, by his blood. Me being made right with God by his blood. Believers have fellowship with Christ because Christ worked for their sin. Saints, the death of Jesus Christ occur, occurred to save us and set us apart for fellowship with God. Why did Jesus save us? He did it to accomplish God's will. Each and every Christian is saved because it was God's will for us to be saved. Why? Because our salvation is part of the eternal purpose of God. I want you to read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, uh, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Look at the last part of verse 10. The purpose of Christ's sacrifices, again, was to save people to save the people of God. Christ positionally sanctified the people through his sacrificial death. God, Jesus made us right with God positionally through his death, not accepting of his sacrifice. Christ offered his holy, sinless body as a sacrifice for our sins. Let's look at 1 Peter real quick. Go back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Okay. He himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his body on a tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, wounds, you have been healed. It says it all right there. Christ, Jesus Christ's sacrifice is once and for all and forever. The death of Jesus has provided total, complete, and perfect salvation for sin and sins. The salvation of Jesus is offered to all and anyone who will believe that Jesus Christ died for his sin. Saints, the purpose of Christ's sacrifice was to redeem man that we might be saved and positionally set apart for God. And point to point number five. The guarantee of Christ's sacrifice. You'll find that in Hebrews 10, verse 11 to 14. Look at verses 11 and 12, Hebrews chapter 10. The priest. 
priests in the tabernacle service, they never sat down, for there were no chairs in the tabernacle. Uh, some of you might be rolling your mind, because I talked about this, I preached about this in February. The priest never sat down because their work was never finished day after day, month after month, year after year, day, sacrifice. People come to offer birth to sacrifice for their sin. However, Jesus made his sacrifice for sin, which was one time, which was final, complete, and perfect. Then Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. Why? Because his work was finished. He yelled, he screamed from the cross, it is finished. Saints, the guarantee to Christ and to us that his death alone is acceptable to forgive sins was that God raised him from the dead and he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God. Look at verse 13. This again is a quote from Psalms, from Psalms 110, verse 2. Jesus Christ reigns because he has a position of power. He's at God's right hand, which is a position of power. And you know, it's funny, uh, when Jesus was walking her, uh, James and John's mother, uh, the son of Zebedee, they, she went to Jesus and, and wanted to get, uh, when Jesus came to his kingdom, they wanted to sit at his left and right hand, on his right hand. And Jesus told them, uh, no, wait a minute. Uh, can y'all handle this thing that I'm going to do? Uh, he said, y'all can take this cup that I'm about to take. They said, sure, we can take the cup. But they didn't understand. Jesus was talking about going to the cross. And that seat was only reserved for Jesus. Jesus pres presently rules with his father. But the day is coming when he's going to leave heaven. Why? Why is he going to eat that seat where he is reigning with his father? Because he's going to come in his second advent to destroy his enemies and to set up his kingdom and to receive you and I. If your Bible says, when he cracks the sky, if you're dead in Christ, if you die in Christ, you're going to rise first. If you're still alive in Christ, you're going to be caught up in the air to be with him. So he is coming back. Those who are perfect, those who, I'm sorry, those who reject Jesus, are his enemies. And all Christ's enemies will be judged without partiality. All these people, atheists, agnostics, these people don't believe in Jesus Christ and trying to convince us that ain't no heaven, ain't no hell. This earth is all there is. And you're a fool for believing that. The Bible said when Jesus comes, every knee's going to bow, every tongue's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Look at verse 14. Again, we reminded that Jesus Christ, through his death, was positionally perfected and sanctified, and he positionally perfects and sanctifies those who are in Christ. Those who believe in Christ are, again, in a perfect position with God. Again, this salvation that he won for us on the cross is for all time. I want you to read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, and Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. All who have trusted in Christ have been guaranteed eternal salvation because of the sacrifice for their sin. In the early church, they were getting worried uh, because Christ hadn't come back yet, and they were worried about the people who had died in Christ. What about them? And Christ had been gone over 2,000 years, and all the saints from the time he died accepted him, they will get their reward. Uh, he had forgotten. Again, like I said, he said the dead in Christ will rise first. And point, point number six, the rewards of Christ's sacrifice. The rewards of Christ's sacrifice. You'll find that in Hebrews 10, verses 15 through 18. Look at verses 15 and 16. Here, the writer now points out that the Holy Spirit also bears witness to the death of Jesus through the scriptures. And he quotes here from Jeremiah 31 uh, concerning the new covenant. God has done away with the Mosaic law as a rule of practice. The Mosaic law no longer exists. But now in the age, we are now in what we call in the age of grace. For the, for, or the age of how we sell the age of the gospel. God writes his eternal uh, moral law on the hearts of all true believers in Christ. God's law is stamped upon our hearts because Christ's sacrifice has saved us. It was his sacrifice that did. 
verse 17, Hebrews 10. The Mosaic law and the sacrifices of the law brought a remembrance of sin and the offers of an offender's conscience could not be cleansed. You see, uh, I want you to go into Galatians real quick. Galatians 3, Galatians 3, verse 24 to 27. Galatians 3, verse 24 to 27. I want you to check that out with me. Okay, you got it? This is important. As you look at Hebrews 10, 17, look at Galatians 3, 24 uh, to 27. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has become, now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. Saints, the law does not matter, and all these churches try to say we need to keep uh, the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses, no longer exists because the, we live under grace, we are living under the new covenant now, not the old covenant. But Christ's sacrifice is the basis of the new covenant, and any sinner who comes to Christ will have his or her sins forgiven, and God will remember them no more. That's what the word says. Look at verse 18. These words, that verse 18, it concludes the doctrinal portion of the book of Hebrews. The teaching, if you will. The defense of the faith. Saints, the arguments made by the author that we receive is convincing and irrefutable concerning the sac not only the sacrifice of Jesus, but the supremacy of Jesus over anything associated with the old covenant. Christ's death is complete and final. All the, all the purposes of atonement are met in Christ. There is no more need for any shedding of blood of animals of anything, nor the death of one more lamb. Christ paid it all. The death of Jesus Christ is adequate for humanity for all eternity. Concluding remarks. Saints, sin are atoned for once and for all by the one offering of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus Christ is complete, final, and the effective offering for sin, past, present, and future. His, let me say it again, His sacrifice for our sin satisfied the wrath of God, past sins, present sins, and future sins. Saints, the truth uh, uh, must really grip us. The one perfect sin offering has been made in Jesus Christ and cannot be made again and does not need to be made again. Jesus Christ has paid it all. The ultimate sacrifice. So, my brothers and sisters, that is one of the greatest defenses of the faith we find in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10, concerning the supremacy of Christ over angels, over Moses, over the old, over the old covenant, over the priesthood. Christ is supreme, and the Hebrew writer leaves no doubt that he is. It was his sacrifice, his substitutionary, we call it substitutionary atonement, that satisfied the wrath of God, that you and I now can believe on Christ through faith, and we have an opportunity at eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to stand for your people. We thank you, God, for your word, and we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says you so love the world that you have sent your only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you, God, because we have eternal life. We have forgiveness of sins. We have the Holy Spirit. We have adoption into your family. We have your grace and mercy. Walk with us day by day because of what your son did on Calvary. No goat, no lamb, uh, 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 no animal could bring uh, us our salvation, could satisfy your wrath. But your son's blood did, and we're so grateful, God. And God, we ask in the name of Jesus.
peace that you continue to touch your people here in the First Baptist Church of Cherry Hill, all our family and our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and also we pray for that lost brother or sister who's out there who does not know you in the part of their sin. Please, God, let them learn of you and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, we thank you again for tuning in uh, to the Not By Better Known Bible Study. We are so grateful to hear my brother to bring you this great opportunity. And we look forward uh, to delving more into the remaining chapters uh, of the book of Hebrews on our next broadcast. Until then, be blessed and we'll talk to you soon.